Well, good morning. Let me welcome you to Tri-City Baptist Church this morning, our live stream service. I want to say happy Easter to each and every one of you. This is the reason why we're here, to celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What a beautiful day we have to worship Him, no matter the circumstances inside or outside. It's also a blessed time to meet together. We're doing it virtually. We appreciate you joining us with us this morning for our special Easter service. I want to thank the Richards family for the beautiful music and the prelude. We're going to have some additional special music in just a few minutes. Let me take just a moment to highlight a couple of announcements as we move this morning. If you want to find out more about Tri-City Baptist Church, the activities we have going, please go to our website, www.tricitybaptist.org. If you missed our Good Friday service this past Friday, it is up. And so you can just go onto our homepage and select the recorded services, and it'll take you right there, and you can choose which one to uh, see or listen to, and I'd encourage you to go visit those uh, opportunities there, as well as just seeing what else is going on here at Tri-City. This coming Tuesday, we will be holding our food bank from 2.30 to 4.30. It is a drive-through event, and so we ask that you would take advantage of that uh, opportunity. Uh, we'll go as long as the food lasts. It is a season of giving. Our Lord and Savior gave his life for us. We know that there are some needs out in our church family and so if you desire, you have opportunity to give to the Benevolence Fund, either through your regular giving, or you can go onto the Simple Church app and give that way. Let's open this service in prayer this morning. And again, I welcome you to our Easter service. Father, we thank you for a beautiful day and a wonderful time to meet together. We thank you, Father, for the blessing of salvation. And it's due to the death, the burial, and resurrection, the victory over death that Christ has won. And we celebrate that this day. And so as we come together in our homes, in our places where we are joining in this live stream, may uh, two or three be gathered together. May the Holy Spirit meet with us as we fellowship and worship this day. Bless our hearts, move in our hearts, challenge us with your word. And Father, if there be anyone here today who does not know Christ and have him as their Savior, may they accept him today. Thank you for loving us and blessing us. Bless this service and our time together. In Christ's name I pray, amen.
Thank you, Victoria. I know that's many of our favorite hymn, the old rugged cross, and it takes us to the nature of the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news is that someone had to die. While Christ was on the cross, there were a number of Old Testament prophecies fulfilled. One of our beautiful psalms in the Psalter, Psalm 22, we call it Messianic. It refers to the suffering and death of Messiah. And you'll recognize in Psalm 22, the very words of our Lord Jesus Christ from the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season, and am not silent. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. Imagine the Savior describing himself as these next verses describe him. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted in the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. And further on, he says, I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. And so Jesus Christ is a fulfillment of this wonderful messianic psalm. He died for you. He died for me. The songwriter says, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died. The instruments are going to play now a beautiful arrangement of that favorite hymn, When I Survey.
Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. After Jesus Christ had been placed in the tomb, the scripture records that he rose triumphant from the grave. And in that great and wonderful passage in 1 Corinthians 15, where our beloved apostle Paul writes concerning the resurrection, for if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so, in Christ shall all be made alive. This morning, I started receiving texts very early, thanks to my East Coast family, and each one of them said the same thing. He is risen. It's a wonderful and traditional Easter greeting, and we reply back, he is risen indeed.
He is not here. He is risen. The songwriter asks a very simple question. It's a song we've sung many times at invitation. And after our hearts have been filled with the world and with all the business of life, the songwriter simply asks the rhetorical question, have you any room for Jesus? Amen. Thank you, Victoria, and thank you, Eva Von Richards and family. The special music this morning, the third of the four songs that you just heard uh, was actually uh, the work of KD, uh, Colin's wife. So thank you uh, all very much. Well, good morning. This is Resurrection Sunday. Every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday, but this one is uniquely set apart for us to recall what Christ did for us several millenniums ago. Uh, for our friends, from California down to Texas, down the South, down to Florida. Welcome for our family and friends in South Carolina and North Carolina and up the Atlantic coast, up through Maryland and Pennsylvania and New York. Welcome, good to have my family and former classmates as we circle back here to Colorado, through Indiana and other states. Uh, welcome here to our service this morning. It's a very unusual day. Uh, my wife is not here. <laughs> So I've had 38 wonderful Easter's with her, and this is the first time we've not shared uh, the occasion together in church. So we regret that, but I'm so thankful for my wife. We met in June of 1981. A lot of things happened that week. It was a week in which I was at a camp in Pennsylvania, 
having my devotions out in the woods, meditating on Psalm 29, verse 8. Uh, the text says, the voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. And as I was reading that text, and it had been weeks, really, maybe months, I been was wrestling with a call to preach. It was there in the woods there in Snydertown, Pennsylvania, that I yielded my heart to God's call to preach. Shortly thereafter, inexplicably, really, I sensed that God would lead me to pastoring two churches over the bulk of my lifetime. And I made reference of that prior to being called to University Baptist Church. On April 7th, 1984, Easter, I became the senior pastor of University Baptist Church in Clemson, South Carolina, and preached my first Easter service. I would preach from that pulpit 18 straight Easter services. Then the Lord transitioned us here to Colorado. I was voted on as a senior pastor of Tri-City Baptist Church in Westminster, Colorado on April 7th, 20, 2002. This Sunday morning's message marks my 18th Easter service preached here at Tri-City Baptist Church. I've had the joy of being a pastor for 36 years and having a wonderful wife, Elisa Jane Isbel Sand, to be my partner and helpmate. Thank you, Elisa. I hope your computer's working at home. Um, I, miss not, I miss having you here. Outside it's snowing or it had been snowing, maybe an inch or so on the ground. So that's unique, not unique to Colorado, but maybe some uniqueness to you if you're in Florida or in other places in the country where you don't usually have snow on Easter morning, but a very unusual day. Beyond that, we have the unique circumstance of COVID-19. And uh, all these circumstances are overwhelming. And yet the truth about Christ's resurrection is like an anchor, it stands true, both yesterday, today, and forevermore. It will be true that Christ arose from the grave. Throughout church history, it's been the resurrection of Christ that's given believers hope, especially in difficult times. When you study the history of pandemics in the last 2,000 years, typically it's the Christian who rises and shines in the midst of tribulation. Uh, we have a pastor in the earlier part of the church history by the name of Cyprian. Cyprian preached to the early church these words. He told his church family not to grieve for Christians who died of the plague, for they live in heaven, but to be double efforts to care for the living. And with that message and messages like that based on the resurrection and the hope that Christians have, the early church grew like wildfire. A century after Cyprian's preaching during a pandemic, there was another pandemic that was taking out approximately 5,000 people a day during the time in which Julian was the emperor. Julian was not a believer in Christ. He had his religious system. He was an unbeliever. And as the pandemic unfolded under his uh, rulership, he recognized that the Christians were the ones out there ministering not only to their own people, but to, to other citizens of his empire. And uh, it, it actually angered him. He called them the Galileans, and he, he summoned his, his pagan priests together, and he said to them, look, uh, we're being hijacked, in essence, by the Christian community. They're out there caring for their own and caring for our people, and we need to match and exceed their efforts. I don't like what's happening. So he exhorted his priests to do likewise. Unfortunately, they did not respond or not respond well. And really the difference between the Christian community and his community was one simple truth that motivated the Christians, and that was the resurrection of Christ and the hope of the resurrection of the believer. I'm gonna share three simple stories here in just a moment uh, regarding the history of the church. The first one is with Martin Luther. Uh, some of our friends from Rome would say that he wandered too far from home while those of the third wave of the Reformation said he didn't go maybe far enough. But as we talked about Martin Luther just briefly, he would teach us much on how to respond to pandemics. It was during the year 1527 and the bubonic plague had hit most of Europe and especially in Germany where he lived in Wittenberg. Uh, it was carried by rats and spread by fleas. Upwards of 50 million people would die in Europe over the next few years. One out of two people in his region Luther was urged to flee Wittenberg, and he uh, thought about it, and then he resolved to stay in his, his beautiful home there. And he said, we die at our posts. Christian doctors cannot abandon their hospitals. Christian governors cannot flee their districts, and Christian pastors cannot abandon their congregations. 
The plague does not dissolve our duties. It turns them into crosses on which we must be prepared to die. He literally would open his house as a hospital ward for those who were sick with the bubonic plague, took enormous risks, and tragically, as they sought to care for those sick around them, there, Luther's little girl of eight months of age would die there in their home as a result of the bubonic plague. Catherine von Bora Luther would write about the death of their little daughter, Elizabeth, on August the 3rd, 1528. She would write, the good Lord gave me a little girl, the sweet little Elizabeth, I'm happy and grateful to the Lord. Here the plague is dead and buried. However, it seemed as if the terrible scourge had marked the child even before she was born. After eight months, the sweet little Elizabeth said goodbye to her father and her mother to go to Christ, passing through death into life. And so the hope that came to her heart would be the resurrection of Christ and the implications of that resurrection for her little girl, Elizabeth. Again, the resurrection would make the difference for those who served. There's another example in church history. There's an example of Charles Spurgeon during the cholera outbreak in the year 1854. Spurgeon was a very young pastor, 20 years of age. He hadn't yet begun publishing his sermons weekly in his penny pulpit. Uh, that would begin in the next year, in 1855. Uh, that would develop into 63 volumes, 3,600 sermons, approximately 25 million words. And his writings would be the most ever written by a Christian before and after. And enjoy greater circulation than any other Christian author in church history. But as a young 20-year-old pastor, the cholera epidemic broke out in London. And he had to make some decisions. Does he run or does he stay at the post? He would learn much from that first cholera epidemic, survive it, would win many to Christ. Thousands would come to church. The hearts of the Londoners were softened through the cholera epidemic. Later in 1866, England would face another cholera epidemic. Learning from the first round, Spurgeon would say this to the pastors in London. He said, and now again is the minister's time. And now is the time for all of you who love souls. You may see men more alarmed than they are already. And if they should be, mind that you avail yourselves of the opportunity of doing them good. You have the balm of Gilead. When their wounds smart, pour it in. You know of him who died to save. Tell them of him. Lift high the cross before their eyes. Tell them that God became man, that man might be lifted to God. Tell them of Calvary and its groans and cries and sweat of blood. Tell them of Jesus hanging on the cross to save sinners. Tell them that there's life for a look at the crucified one. Tell them that he's able to save to the uttermost all them that come unto God by him. Tell them that he's able to save even at the 11th hour and to say to the dying thief, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. The truth that made a difference for Luther, for Spurgeon, for Cyprian, was Christ's resurrection and the future hope of the resurrection of the bodies of believers in Christ. One last example of a epidemic in this case was in the year 1849, a little closer to home, not in Germany, not in London, but here in America. On June 25th, 1849, an extremely sick man by the name of Shepherd and his partner, a German immigrant woman, was on a train and they got off of the train in Sandusky, Ohio. Unfortunately, Shepard had cholera. He would never leave the little town of Sandusky, about 4,000 people at the time. He would recover, but she would not. The result of what they brought into town because of maybe carelessness, maybe just ignorance, was that one out of four people, one out of 10 people in Sandusky would die of the cholera. There's one particular man there in the city of Sandusky by the name of Erastus. Erastus was the city's postmaster. His wife was named Fanny. Erastus and Fanny lived there in Sandusky. He knew everyone. He saw many people getting sick and it broke his heart. And so he wanted to go out and minister in mercy to his, his friends and the community that he knew so well as their postman. Sadly, he would contract the cholera, would bring it into his family, he would die. And unfortunately, at the same time as he, was, as he died, Fanny recognized that her son, George Anderson, 
was violently seized by the cholera disease. And tragically, it appeared that he gave up the ghost. She actually invited the man that would come up and down the streets of, of this city of Sandusky with a little cart. So if you lost someone in your family, you were to notify him, he would come into the house and take the body. He'd come in and measure the body for a casket if they had time or money to do so. Tragic losses. How do you handle that kind of loss in an epidemic? You lose a loved one. What is the truth that gets you through? There's really only one truth that really gets you through uh, permanently and eternally, and that is, that is truth. It's the faith in Christ and his bodily resurrection and its implications for those who are believers in Christ. So throughout church history, the church has been encouraged through pandemics and epidemics by the doctrine of the resurrection of Christ. This morning, we're going to look at 38 hours from the cross to the resurrection. When it comes to the cross, we looked at that on Good Friday in some detail. When you look into the Old Testament, the, the cross was predicted, actually its year, the very year in which Jesus was to die, be cut off, was predicted in Daniel chapter 9. If you understood the typology of Leviticus 23 and the Levitical feasts, you would recognize that the Messiah would die in a particular month, on a particular day, at a particular hour, on a particular feast known as Passover. So putting together the Old Testament prophecies, you could have known the very year, the month, the day, and the very hour in which Messiah would die. Jesus himself would explain over and over to his own disciples uh, that he was going to die and be resurrected the third day. For a large portion of his earthly ministry with the 12, he was trying to explain to them who he was. That was really the million-dollar question when they were at Caesarea Philippi, and he asked the 12, who do men say that I am? And who do you think I am? Who am I? And Peter, representing the group, says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And indeed, he was accurate. Jesus was the Son of God. One God, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Jesus being the second person of the Trinity. Once they understood his identity, it was at that point that Jesus immediately began to, to teach them his purpose, his mission, why he came to earth, born for a virgin. Mark 8, 31, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. Mark 9, 31, for he taught his disciples and said unto them, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. Mark 10, 33, the third time he tells him between uh, Caesarea Philippi and his death saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death and shall deliver him to the Gentiles. And they shall mock him and shall scourge him and shall spit upon him and shall kill him. And the third day shall he rise again. These are amazing predictions. The Old Testament predicted the year, the month, the day, the hour in which he would die. Now Jesus gives more particulars. He tells you where he was going to die. He told you those who'd be involved in seeing him executed, both Jews and Gentiles. He talks about the actual way he would die through, through execution on a cross, through crucifixion. He talks about what would precede the execution, such as scourging. He talks about when and goes on to give more details about his death. And then he says, after this, please remember, I will rise from the grave the third day. It couldn't be any clearer. And yet his disciples just could not grasp that message. That's so what all unfolded. It really took them off guard. It shouldn't have. The Lord forewarned them on three special occasions. But nonetheless, they didn't see it coming. It was afterwards when Jesus arose that it all came together for them where they could go forward and tell the world of Christ. During the earthly ministry of the Lord, he would talk about his death, burial, and resurrection explicitly to his men. But when it came to the enemies, the unbelievers, the scorners, the mockers, uh, he wasn't so quick to, to give such information about his mission. In Matthew's account, there were certain of the scribes and the Pharisees. The Pharisees were a very, very strict branch of Judaism. Not a lot of Pharisees in the first century, about 6,000, very small group. It was the Sadducees who dominated. The Sadducees were the liberals of the day. The Pharisees were hyper-conservative uh, to, to a fault. Well, they came to Jesus and 
somewhat <laughs> hypocritically, master, you know, teacher, rabbi, we would see a sign from thee. So they came and they asked the Lord to, to do something to confirm, to show, to demonstrate who he is and what his purpose was. And Jesus answered and said unto them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. He's saying, look, the word of God has made it very clear, you know, my plan that I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. So much is revealed in the scripture, all that you really need. And, and yet you've not believed. And now you want a sign, you want a miracle. He says, there should be no sign given to it. And we know the Lord gave many signs. 35 different types of miracles were performed by Jesus to authenticate, to confirm who he was, the son of God, God in the flesh. But he gives to them the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So one, that tells you a lot about what Jesus thought about the story of Jonah, but beyond that, more importantly, is he just told them something. He told these scribes and Pharisees that the Son of Man would be placed in the earth, the heart of the earth, death, for three days and three nights. And when they observe that, they should believe especially when he, Jesus, would come alive from the heart of the earth. And so there was a sign here. He left them with this message. Now, here's the question theologians have. Three days and three nights, if you take that to its strict literal point, that's 72 hours from Christ's death, burial, to his resurrection, 72 hours. And so we're going to walk through that formula for just a moment. Some people struggle with it. Okay, how, how many hours were there between the execution, the death at three o'clock on Passover and his resurrection sometime on Sunday uh, before 6 a.m. that morning. I'm going to suggest that the distance between point A and B, the time, was approximately 38 hours. So I believe in a, a crucifixion that took place on Friday, hence Good Friday, and not, as some would think, Thursday or Good Thursday. So let's walk through this formula for just a moment. First, it's important to realize when he told these Jews, these authorities, these scholars, that he would be in the earth three days and three nights, they would understand it probably a little differently than we would. They would understand that to mean that he, Jesus, would die, be buried, and that he'd be in the earth for parts of three days. Let me explain what I mean by that. John Broadus, the theologian, said our Lord was actually in the grave less than 36 or 38 hours but it began before the close of Friday and closed in the morning of Sunday. And according to the mode of counting time among the Jews, this would be reckoned three days, both the first and the last uh, day being always included. The Jews reckoned the night and day as together constituting one period. And a part of this period was counted as the whole. So John Bronis, one of our theologians, has written that he understood as from a Jewish perspective, that any part of a day would be reckoned as a complete day in the mind of a Jew. William Hendrickson, another theologian, wrote, he was indeed in the heart of the earth three days and three nights, that is, during three of these time units, or parts of three days. J.B. Lightfoot, another Greek scholar, I think more substantial quote, because he's quoting from the Jerusalem Talmud, an instruction manual for the Jewish people, and he identifies within that writing that what, what Hendrickson said and Broadus wrote is exactly how the Jews thought. Quoting from the Talmud, a Jewish book, a day and a night make an ona, and a part of an ona, or part of a day, is seen as the whole. So I'm going to say that those three days and three nights, they do not have to be fulfilled by an exact 72-hour time period, but it must be seen where Jesus is in the earth for parts of three days and those three days representing the whole. This is how I envision it happening. So if you look at the chart here, Jesus dies on April 7th, 30 AD, at the age of about 33 and a half, Jewish month Nisan, the 15th day of the month, full moon of that month, when they would celebrate the Passover. We know Jesus dies at three o'clock that afternoon the Sabbath will begin at 6 o'clock, just about, at the setting of the sun. Uh, the sun sat at, oh, about 6.20 that night, 
It's what the scientists have de uh, described for that day in history in Israel. And so around six o'clock, the Sabbath would begin for the Jewish people. So that meant as a Jew, you would have to bury your loved one or the dead before the setting of the sun. That's the way Jews did it then. They still do it today. You bury the person that day. So they had about three hours, whoever they would be, to bury the body of Jesus. So Friday, he's going to be buried, and he'll be in the grave for parts of three hours. How long did it take for them to bury? How long was he in the tomb? No more than three hours. When it comes to the Sabbath, which is measured from Saturday, Friday night, 6 o'clock, to Saturday night, 6 o'clock, those 24 hours, that would be the second day. He's in the grave, his body, his body in the grave. And then Sunday begins Saturday night at 6, and by 6 o'clock in the morning, on that Sunday, April the 9th, Jesus is resurrected. So in the grave, upwards to 10 to 12 hours. So when you do the math, three at the most on Friday, 24 on Saturday, 10 to 12 on Sunday, that gives you a plus minus of about 38 hours in the, in the tomb. Now, if you believe Jesus was died on Thursday, this would be how your grid would look. You're going to have your three nights. You still don't have the 72 hours. You still have to acknowledge that the days were part of days. In this case, it would be three nights and parts of four days. And I don't think that reflects on the Jewish thought of Friday, Saturday, and Sunday representing the three days I think that Jesus had in mind. You can look at that more carefully on your, no, on your own. But we do know this, that Jesus dies on the Passover at 3 o'clock, giving his life for us, paying for all of our sins in full. And in Mark 15, verse 37, and Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. Gave up the ghost. He gave up his spirit. So now the question is, at 3 o'clock he dies. What happens during those 38 hours? And we're going to take a few moments this morning to describe what the Scripture says about what happened during those 36, 37, 38 hours between his death and his resurrection. Let's begin between 3 and 6. The Scripture gives us plenty of instruction as to what happened, the major parts. So let's look at it. Mark chapter 15, verse 43. You have Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor. That means he is a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court. There are 70 such members overseen by the high priest, 71 in total. So Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. So this is amazing. At, at the cross, Joseph watches apparently the death of Jesus. He's with a friend who's also a Sanhedrin member. His name is Nicodemus. These two come out publicly now and identify with, with the corpse of Jesus, and they want to do the honorable thing. They want to bury Jesus before 6 p.m. The other thieves, and likely Jesus would have been put in a cart and taken out of the city down to, to where the garbage dump was, a place called Gehenna. They're in the valley where the fire was never put out, really a picture of hell. In fact, Jesus would talk about hell using the garbage dump as an illustration, as, as the background. So what you have here is Joseph going to Pilate. Poor Pilate, what a raunchy day he had. Can you imagine what that was like that night when he goes to bed and his wife said, I told you not to mess around. I told you not to... To, 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 to deliver that Jesus over to the people. I told you it wouldn't turn out real well. And you just see Pilate saying, I was manipulated. I was handcuffed. I was hamstrung. Uh, they, they boxed me in, honey. I, I didn't want to do what I did. Boy, what an interesting night he had. In fact, he's never going to get over what he did. He washed his hands of it, but he could never wash his conscience of it. Pontius Pilate will actually commit suicide. He, he never could get over the guilt of putting Jesus of Nazareth to death. And so on this day, you have Joseph going back to the Antonia Fortress, back to the Praetorium, back to Pilate, and says, look, you know, you know me. I'm a major, I'm a leader and shaker here in the city. We know each other. And um, I'd like to have permission to take the body of Jesus off the cross and bury it. And of course, uh, this was quite shocking for, for Pilate to hear. The main reason is Jesus had only been on the cross for about six hours. 
And so Mark writes, Pilate, that states that Pilate marveled if he were already dead. So he calls in the coroner, the centurion, and says, look, uh, is this true? Is this Jesus dead? And the centurion makes it very, very clear that one of his own soldiers had put a spear up into the pericardium, the double-walled sack around his heart, and had watched the blood and the pericardial fluids flow from the heart of Jesus. So he could say, yes, I, I can sign the death warrant. He died of crucifixion with a broken heart. He's dead. So with that information given to Pilate, Pilate then says to him, you can have the body. You can do what you like. So we know this takes place between three and six. While Joseph is arguing and seeking to persuade Pilate to take the body, Nicodemus is on another mission. Uh, the stores are, are open to six o'clock, and, and, and Nicodemus wants to do something with Joseph in burying Jesus. They want to do it right or as quickly as they can. So what's happening, Joseph goes to Pilate, Nicodemus goes and seeks to get uh, very special uh, myrrh and aloes. In fact, John chapter 19, verse 39 says, and there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. At hundred pounds, about 70 to 80 pounds in our, our, our system of weights. So, so Nicodemus, that's a lot, that's a lot. That's an expensive shopping trip that he just took there. A mixture of myrrh and aloes, and he likely has some help. He's probably not carrying that alone. He has his servants working with him likely. And so Nicodemus and Joseph are going to rendezvous back at the cross outside the northern gate of the city. In Mark chapter 15, verse 46 says, and he brought fine linen and took him down. You know, you can't help but think about Nicodemus. He'd come to Jesus at night and he wanted to know more about Jesus. He said, the things you do are just overwhelming. You can't do the things you're doing except you have a relationship with God in some way. And Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again to see the kingdom of God. You must be born anew. You must be born from above if you're going to go into my kingdom, enter, enter it physically in the future. And Nicodemus was just befuddled by that statement, and, and Jesus kind of rebuked him and said, look, you, you know, you're the master of Israel. You know, you're one of the leading scholars in the day, and you don't know your Old Testament well enough that in the Old Testament that when Israel was wandering in the wilderness and, and they, they elevated that bronze pole, that stick with a serpent on it, and if you would look up, to, to that snake on the, that, that bronze serpent on the pole that you would live, you would survive the snake bite of sin, the snake, the snake bite there in the wilderness. And he was trying to tell him that, Nicodemus, I'm going to be lifted up like that serpent in the wilderness. I'm going to be the sa savior, the solution uh, for, for man's soul. And you can just see Nicodemus at the cross looking up and realizing there is Jesus on the pole, on the tree. And whether he made the connection there or not, that that's what Jesus was telling him earlier, we do not know. But they're coming out of the closet with their faith in Jesus. They're going to lose everything. Nicodemus's name will actually be blotted out in Jewish history and in their list as the master that he was. His name will be seen in church history, but when it comes to the Jewish records, they literally blot out his name because of his faith in Jesus as the Messiah. So they brought the linen, they took him down, and they wrapped him in the linen. So you can imagine they put the body on the ground and they wrap his body with the linen. And as they wrap him like a mummy, they're putting in the, the, the myrrh and the aloes. They also are wrapping his head separately with a napkin, another linen piece separately. So it's basically a two piece burial cloth that's being described in the scriptures, one around the head, one around the body, and interspersed with this mixture of myrrh and aloes. So that scriptural understanding, which comes from John 20, verse 6, which reads, Then comes Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher, going to the empty tomb. He saw the linen clothes lie and the napkin, two pieces are being described, that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, that's John, which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. John, the apostle, believed in the resurrection of Christ when he went into the empty tomb, looked over there into the burial chamber, and he saw the linen clothes all wrapped up, not unwrapped, not aloe and myrrh thrown all over the place, scattered randomly or in chaos or in a hurry. No, it just sat there. Nothing was moved. 
except the body. The body had come right through the, the burial cloths. So what's this mean? One, it means that the Shroud of Turin, although historic and, and significant and fascinating, is not the burial cloth of Jesus. That's a one-piece burial cloth. The scriptures speak of two, one around the body, one around the head. When, Jesus, when John saw the burial cloths and no body, he knew what had happened. Jesus was alive. That's when he believed in the resurrection. Now, with that in mind, Joseph is going to bury, with Nicodemus' help, Jesus in his own grave, his own tomb. Obviously, Joseph had been thinking a lot about death. He's getting up in age. It's appointed on the man wants to die. He knew that. We know that. Actually, the resurrection message is really only good for people who believe they're going to die. If you're not going to die, this, really, this message is extremely mute. You don't need this message. The, the resurrection of Christ, this good news message, is only for people who are going to die. So if you're not going to die, you can just turn this off. You're wasting your time. But if you're going to die, then this is significant. And Joseph is thinking about death. He has in place his tomb. It's empty. These are family burial sites. He thinks he'll probably be the first one to be buried there. Usually you would be buried. You'd be wrapped in these linens. Your body would decay. After a time, you'd just have the bones. Then you would take the bones and put them in a box, an ossuary box, and you'd put the box in another room for, for the wealthy in that, in that tomb. And the next person who dies, their body becomes bones over time. You put it in another ashray box, and they're gathered unto their people, physically in this case. So sure enough, Joseph buries him in his own tomb. Now the scriptures give us at least seven points as to what that tomb was like. And uh, I was just there again, Elisa and I, and 41 or three of us from our church and friends. We were just there, right there. And as I look at this tomb, whether this is the historic location or the other site that is in, is, it, 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 there's some thoughts regarding the two spots, pros, cons, I'm sure. But this tomb that we go to, it has to have these seven features if it's going to fit into the biblical picture. Number one, it had to be very close to the place of crucifixion. Well, if you go around the corner, maybe 100 yards, that's the place of Golgotha, the skull. So this tomb fits that description. It had to have a garden nearby, and they have done some archaeological research, and there was a garden there, the evidence of a garden. Number three, it has to be an empty tomb. Now, you could have people in it and taken out later, I'm sure. There's been a lot of grave robbers over the years, but this tomb was never used. It's quite obvious. It's obvious because what they do is they make slots in these tombs, and when you die, they, they carve out some or chisel some of the stone to, to customize it to this to the size of the deceased. That hadn't been fully done yet. It's an empty tomb. It had to be a rolling stone entrance. That's very extravagant. Those stones would weigh a ton, two tons. And you roll down that, that little corridor and put it in front, of the, in front of the stone, in front of the door to keep out you know, bad guys and birds and animals and whatever. It had some logistical issues, of course. You had to work through that. But uh, this is an extremely extravagant, wealthy man's tomb. There's only three of these in all of Israel, an op a rolling stone tomb. So it's expensive. Carving into that stone had to be an expensive tome, tomb. And Joseph was a wealthy man. There had to be a weeping chamber. So when you came in, there would have to be a room, an opening where you would stand first. And you'd weep, mourn. And then uh, the Bible says to the right of that chamber is the burial chamber with a burial bench. And when you look into this particular site I just showed you, that's to the right. It's exactly how the Bible describes it. So it's my opinion, and only that, that this is, is the very tomb that Jesus was placed in. And as you can see, it's, it's still empty. So sometime between 3 and 6 o'clock, Jesus was buried in Joseph's tomb. And uh, while they were burying him, the women that were there at the cross are there also at his burial, and you'll see them at his resurrection. You know, if I was writing this story, and if you were a Jew writing this story, you wouldn't, you wouldn't spin the story about women and, and women giving witness. Uh, that wouldn't be how you would write the story, especially in a Jewish court of law, with their male chauvinism, it just doesn't work real well. But this is how God designed it, that the first to see his resurrection would be a woman. Very interesting. I wouldn't write it that way, perhaps, 
you would think of maybe another story to tell if you were spinning it. But this is a historic story. So sure enough, Mary Magdalene and the Mary, the other Mary of mother of Joseph, beheld where he was laid. They took note where he was buried because they're coming back. The men had just wrapped the body of Jesus with all the aloes and myrrh. You know, that's a man doing it. These are women. They do a much better job wrapping. Uh, you know, just you look at your Christmas tree at Christmas. If you came to the Sen house, the beautiful package is wrapped. That's my wife. The horrible wrapping jobs and the plastic bags and the brown bags and just horrific looking things, that's the guys. So these women, they're going to come back. They're going to tidy things up a little bit. They want to do their own things to honor Jesus. They're going to buy some myrrh. They're going to buy some things to, to, to sprinkle there. Uh, we give our flowers. They give their myrrh and aloes. So now the next question is, Jesus is buried before the Sabbath begins at 6. Now what does he do between that time, his burial, and his resurrection? What's going to happen during this time period? Physically, we know where his body is. Spiritually, what about his spirit? Where does his spirit go during, after his death and before his resurrection? We know he cried from the cross, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. That was at 3 o'clock. So we know that he is going to be with his heavenly Father in spirit in heaven. We also know that that is true by what he said earlier to the repentant thief. He said, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Today you're going to be with me in heaven. That, that repentant, believing thief at his death is very clearly implied here. He's going to be with God in heaven. Why? What good did he, this man do? Well, it wasn't based on the man's goodness. <laughs> it was based on the man's faith and the object of his faith being Jesus. As little as he knew, he cried out in faith to Jesus. And that's what saves souls. By faith are ye saved. So we know he's going to be in heaven in his spirit. His body's going to remain in the grave. The body and spirit will be reunited on, on Sunday. But what happens during those 36, 37, 38 hours? So we're going to walk through that just for a moment. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 says, Therefore we are always confident. We have confidence in this. We know this, that while we're at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Paul says, look, this is how it works. Right now we live by sight, by, by faith. When we see Jesus in the future in heaven, we'll live by sight. For right now, we're absent from the Lord, but when we die, we are absent from our body and immediately present with God. So it's very clear. The scriptures teach that when a person who believes in Jesus dies, they're immediately in heaven. There's no, there's no middle stopping place. There's only two, two, two locations on the biblical shelf. When you die, you either immediately go to heaven or you immediately go to hell. There's not a third or fourth or fifth location in view in scripture. Only two places, heaven for the believer in Christ, hell for those who rejected Jesus. So Jesus is setting the example. He dies. He, his spirit will be absent from his body. Now, where does that spirit go? We know that that day he's going to go to be with his father. Is there any more to the story? We have an Apostles' Creed that the Apostles didn't write, but it says something about how Jesus descended into hell. What's that all about? Where do you get that even that concept or even possibility? Well, I'll try to answer that in 1 Peter. So one of the more difficult passages, maybe in the New Testament, is where, where Peter writes about Christ's death. Look at verse 18. For Christ also once suffered for sins. So it talks about his death. Verse 22, we, we, took, we see here he, he goes to heaven. He's gone into heaven. So this passage deals with his death and going to heaven, where he's at the right hand of God. And now we have to evaluate, analyze what happens between his death and his, his arrival in heaven. Well, this text tells us some things. Let's quickly walk through it. We see Christ dying, suffering for what? For our sins. He paid for our sins. It is finished, paid in full. We see that his death was vicarious, or we could say substitutionary. He was just. He was perfect. He was without spot or blemish. And he died in behalf of of unbelievers, unjust people, sinners. 
So he died in our place to pay for our sins. And then it says for this purpose that he might bring us, bring that person who repents and believes in them, brings us to God. And then it describes something very significant here regarding Jesus being put to death in the flesh. So in relationship to his human body, his physical flesh, he, Jesus, was put to death. And then it is, he is described as being quickened by the Spirit. And so there's a quickening work of the Spirit described here. And then that word pneuma, Spirit, is then described further in verse 19, by which, by that Spirit, he went, the verb means to go on a journey, to go on a trip. So by that Spirit, he goes on a trip, which leads him to preaching to someone. And in the Greek language, you have two verbs, two different words for preach. One is euangelizomai, to preach the gospel. I'm preaching that this morning. And there's another verb, the verb caruso, which means to proclaim. So if you had a king coming into the service, we, we would proclaim the king's arrival. We had our governor come before us. And uh, it's very exciting to have our, our deaf church listening to the message this morning, or at least having it signed to you. Chris Penley, thank you for signing for our deaf church. And uh, she is the uh, signer for the deaf community for Governor Paulus. So I'll do that. Thank you, Chris. If he came in, our governor, we would proclaim the arrival, the declaration, the proclamation uh, of, a, of a governor. And this happens to be the verb here. He is not giving people in this place a second chance. He's making a proclamation, a declaration. He is talking about a king. And he happens to be that king. So he goes, he makes a proclamation unto who? What, who's the audience? What's the congregation? It's spirits. doesn't say bodies and spirits. It's where spirits are. Where are they? They're in a prison, a metaphor for hell. So Jesus, between his death and his resurrection, does go by the Spirit on a trip to, to hell, and he makes a proclamation to those spirits there. Who are these spirits? Well, it tells you more in the next verse. They were, they were disobedient spirits. I'm sure all the spirits of the unsaved person are in the same prison, but a certain group's being highlighted, a, a disobedient spirits who were there in the days of Noah. So, wow, Genesis 6 will give us more definition as to who those spirits were. And he's making a proclamation to those spirits. What is he saying to those spirits? I think it comes back to Colossians 2.15, where it says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, spirits and powers, he, Jesus, made a show of those spirits, those principalities, triumphing over those principalities in it, in the staros, in the cross. So when Jesus died on the cross, he made a, a triumphant statement, a declaration of victory, over, the, over, the, over these different groups, these principalities and powers that were not yet reserved in the, in the place called prison or hell. So it makes a proclamation of the cross, clear message of victory over sin. And now he makes, I think, the same message of proclamation of victory over these, over these spirits which are in hell. Very powerful passage. And then he gets very complicated where he talks about being saved by water Technically, they were, they were saved by the ark, these eight that he describes. Just like baptism doesn't save you, it pictures uh, in, a, in a typological way what, what Christ does through his resurrection. So there's some really neat stuff going on here. Water, water did not technically save those eight. The ark saved them. Baptism does not save us. Technically, it's a resurrected Christ, and only Christ who can save us. And then it says in verse 22, who's gone into heaven? Who's gone into heaven? And so what goes on between, I believe, the death of Christ and his resurrection, I believe that first day in his spirit, he goes and he makes a proclamation to these spirits in prison. When you look at Ephesians 4, 9, that seems to confirm what I just said. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? So this message of Jesus making a proclamation to these unbelieving and disobedient spirits in hell is something that the early church picked up on. In fact, by 390 AD, there was a creed, not that the apostles wrote it. Uh, these words were found in a letter uh, from the Council of Milan, probably written by Ambrose, 12 different statements. 
It's organized in a Trinitarian fashion, emphasizing the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let me read it. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Under Pontius Pilate, he was crucified, died, and was buried. And here's the phrase we're looking at. He descended into hell. That's 1 Peter 3. On the third day, he rose again. Notice they put his dissension into hell between his death and his resurrection. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic. The word Catholic in that historic context would mean global or universal church, not the organized church in Rome, but the Holy Catholic, the universal aspect of the church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So personally, I can concur and confess that creed. I believe between his death and his resurrection, he went first in his spirit to make a proclamation to those in hell, and then he went to heaven. And that day he was with that thief in paradise, and that day in his spirit he was with his heavenly Father, and God is spirit. Now what else takes place during those 36 hours? Just a couple last thoughts. We know that next day, Saturday, look at Matthew 27, 62. Now the next day, that following the day of the preparation, Friday would be your preparation for the Sabbath each week. So the next day, following Friday, that would be Saturday. This is an unusual mission for, for Jews to take on because they're going to go see the Roman governor. The chief priests and Pharisees came together on the pilot, so quite an entourage, and they came to the governor once again, and they have a plea to make. They, they, they've been talking all day. What are we going to do about Jesus? You know, what are we going to do? He said something about being resurrected the third day. What if, what if those, those crazy disciples uh, get, take his body and hide the body and then go all around town saying he's alive, he's alive. Well, this, this will be a disaster. So we've got to cut that idea off. This is only day two. We have a little time, but not much to make something happen. So they go to Pilate. Why would they go to Pilate? Because they're going to ask him a favor. They say, Pilate, sir, we remember that the deceiver, that's Jesus, said, while he was yet alive, he said this, after three days I will rise again. We remember what he said. <laughs> Ironically, the disciples didn't. He says, command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people he's risen from the dead. So the last there, this heresy of him coming alive, shall be worse than the first error. The first error was he claimed to be God, Messiah, God in flesh, Pilate said unto them, you have a watch. He, he uses the imperative. He, he says, look, you, you command me, you, you implore me for a watch. You've got it. I command it. It's yours. So immediately going out the door with this Jewish entourage will be 16 skilled Roman soldiers. And they're going to go, and they're going to guard this tomb until after the third day. And then after that, it's a mute point. Jesus said he'd be alive the third day, and if he doesn't come alive on Sunday, and, and we, they can guard that tomb and that, that corpse, then, then, the, then the story shut down. So they went and made the sepulchre shore, sealing the stone and setting a watch. So let's, let's explain what they did. So you've got 16 Roman soldiers. The word there, have a guard, is the word custodia which is the word for a Roman uh, legion of 16 highly trained soldiers. They're going to come, four of them. They're going to work four-hour shifts. So it'll be four at the tomb at any one time. They're there for four hours, and then the next shift of four comes in, and then the next shift of four comes in, and the next shift of four comes in, and they'll cycle in again as needed. These, these are amazing trained men. These men are responsible for six square feet of space. So when they station himself in front of that, that tomb, there's going to be four of them. Each of them has, has 36 square feet. They're going to say, this is, my, this is my footage. This is my house. No one comes into my house. So put these four men together. You have a 36 by 36 square that they're saying, no one will enter this. And they are loaded for bear. These guards, they cannot sit during their four-hour their four hour watch. 
They cannot lean against anything while they're on duty doing a four-hour watch. If a guard member, by Roman guard law, if a Roman guard fell asleep during his four-hour watch, that guard was beaten and then burned with his own clothes. But that's not all. He also would have his entire squad of 16 men also executed. So if just one of the 16 falls asleep, all 16 are executed. This is a serious responsibility to be a Roman guard, and they took it very serious. So they came to the, to the tomb. I'm going to suppose, it's not written in the scripture, but I have a feeling these men rolled the stone back uphill a little bit and went into the tomb. I'm, it's not written in the scripture. I think they did it. I think they came into the tomb, saw that the body was there. They, they weren't going to guard an empty tomb. So they're convinced the body is wrapped up in the linen burial cloth. They then roll that one to two ton stone back down into its lower groove. And now they put themselves in position at a four hour watch. But they also, the Bible says, set a seal. So they stretched a cord, perhaps two cords across the stone. And in the middle of that, that crossing or affixed to the sides would be a seal the seal of the Roman governor, Pilate. So no one can enter in by breaking that seal unless they have authority by the governor of Jerusalem, which was Pontius Pilate. So it's sealed. You have four soldiers at a time in, 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 in very, very much alert mode. And they know it's a short-term duty. They probably laughed at it. This is the first time they probably ever guarded a, a dead man's body, but they were there. They're really serious. These are guys not easily shaken, I'm sure, but we're going to find out what happens to these guys on the first day of the week. Notice what the scriptures say. In the end of the Sabbath, so Saturday now clicks by, three hours in the tomb on Friday, 24 hours in the tomb on Saturday. Now we're coming into Sunday morning. It began to dawn toward the first day of the week came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers, the guards did shake and became as dead men. So those guards who may have hee-hawed and laughed during their their duty, they're not laughing anymore. The women were afraid that when they got to the tomb, they wouldn't have the energy, the strength, the, the wherewithal to remove the stone to go in and do what they like to do with the corpse, the body of Jesus. So God took care of that problem. Jesus did not need the stone to be rolled away to come out of the tomb. The body that elevated through the, 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 the garments of death did not need a stone to be rolled away. We'll find out on the same day that he will literally walk through the door that was locked without it being opened, and joined his disciples later in the day. Tells you something about the resurrected body. It's a little, diff a little different configuration than the body we experience today. Those keepers did shake. They're going to run from the scene. And I just described to you, you don't run from your, your duty as a Roman soldier. But they shook, and there was dead men, and they would leave the scene. We got a big problem. <laughs> At least the Jews had a big problem. They have enormous damage control now. <laughs> this story's getting worse. First, they weren't planning to crucify Jesus on the Passover, but the opportunity came. The people in the city are really, really torqued over that. Why would you kill anyone at the very moment the Passover lamb is being slain on a, such a sacred feast? You know, like, really, would you kill someone on Christmas? Would you have the death penalty? Really? Very distasteful. They got a problem in the temple. The temple's a wreck. The veil's been destroyed. You just don't put another veil up. Uh, you don't keep that in the closet. You don't have extra veils the size of the, the temple veil. They got issues. They got to explain how that veil ripped from the top to the bottom. You had three hours of darkness on that Good Friday from noon to three. How do you explain that? And when Jesus died, there was an earthquake, and now there's a great earthquake. And you had another big problem. When the earthquake took place on the first day of the week, the graves were open to the east of the city. If you're on the Mount of Olives, you know exactly the cemetery I'm talking about. 
and the bodies came out of the grave, and the Bible says they walked into the city. You know, you've got to be kidding. This is, in, this is crazy. And now you've got an empty tomb. You have soldiers running for their lives. Wow, you've got big problems. And rather than just believing the simple fact that Jesus is God, that Jesus paid for the sins of the world, rather than just believing Jesus is alive, we see the depravity of man, where we're rather than accepting the, the facts and accept Jesus to their heart, they come up with a scheme to say, look, let's just pay off these guards. <laughs> let's just tell them that, that, that the, the disciples came by night and stole them away. Folks, there is no theory that you can present other than one historic truth, Jesus came alive. They didn't come to steal his body. They, they weren't in an emotional position to do that. They weren't in a position to take on guards. Are you kidding? And then the burial linen, it wasn't turned upside down. There wasn't myrrh and aloes all over the place as, as they took the body in a hurry. No there's, no, there's no swoon theory. You don't survive 80 pounds of myrrh and aloes wrapped around your body for three days after you suffered scourging and execution on a cross and a sword up into your, up into your heart. Are you kidding? He died, and now he rose again. This is Sunday. Let's finish. That morning, very early in the morning, while well, it was still dark, as the women were walking to the place they remembered where he was buried, the sun, S-U-N, begins to rise. And I believe as the S-U-N rose, the S-O-N rose. Wonderful stories. The women come. They come to the tomb. The stone has been rolled away. It's on its side where the angel sat, I'm sure smiled, in his glorious countenance. And these women came. Which women came? Mary Magdalene? Whoa, what a rough background she had. She came. The Mary, the mother of James, came. Salome came. Joanna came. And there was actually some other women that came. It's amazing what's going to take place on this first day. Jesus is going to appear to a number of people. In fact, over the next 40 days, there will be 10 resurrection appearances, first to Mary Magdalene and to the women, then to Peter, and then the two on the road to Emmaus, then back in Jerusalem that same night to see the 10 apostles in the upper room. So points one through five were the appearances of Jesus on the first day of the week when he rose from the grave. And then he's going to appear the next week to Thomas and the, the, the other 10, the 11 apostles, and then he will be seen by 500 eyewitnesses that Paul wrote about. And Paul, when he writes this in 1 Corinthians 15, says, look, he, 500 people saw him alive, and some of those witnesses are still alive. You can talk to them. James, the half-brother of Jesus, that's going to change his home. James, who didn't believe in Jesus as Messiah. James, who didn't believe in the resurrection, now has an encounter with his half-brother, Jesus, who's resurrected, and he believes, and James will be the, the leader of, of the church in Jerusalem and the writer of the little epistle of James. Then we see him appearing to the apostles in Galilee, which leads to the later the ascension back in Jerusalem at the Mount of Olives. And the apostle born out of time, and at a different time period, was the apostle Paul. Wow, 40-day stretch. He appears to men and women, one-on-one, -on -one, small groups, the 500. He appears to those in Jerusalem, on the road to Emmaus, Sea of Galilee, Mount of Olives. How much more evidence do you need? Jesus is alive. And that truth is what steadies us through with any storm that comes our way in life, including the coronavirus. The, the, the anchor to the human soul is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave. This is our message. This is our hope. This is what motivates and drives people through difficult times. I mentioned earlier the story of Erastus Cook. That sounded kind of random, and it was. That's my family. When that cholera outbreak took place in Sandusky in 1849, Erastus died, the postmaster. He had a little eight-year-old boy, George Anderson. It appeared he had died, and they invited the man with the cart to come up into the house and to measure the little boy's body for a casket, and then to take the body out make the casket and put it in a, out, in the, in, out into the uh, cholera cemetery that they had just freshly created for such people. 
This would be the house they came to, which became a post office there, I believe, in Sandusky today on the left. On the right's my mom. Hi, mom. That's my mom, and she's standing by Fanny's grave there in Sandusky, Ohio. When they came to measure the little body of George, as they were putting the measuring stick up to his body, George came out of a comatose state. The family thought he was dead. He came out and he grabbed his mother and he said, I'm not going unless I go, unless my mother goes with me. And he survived a near death experience during the cholera outbreak of 1849. If George didn't survive, there would be no James Francis Cook, the editor of the A2 Music Magazine. If George didn't survive, there'd be no Francis Sherman Cook, the artist. If there was no Francis Sherman Cook, there wouldn't have been a James Cook or her, his brother, his, his sister, Allison Cook. If there was no Allison Cook, there wouldn't have been a William John Sen III or a Sherman Bruce or an Andrew Bryan Sen. If there was no William John Sen III, there would be no William John Sen IV or James Tecumseh Sen or Benjamin Clarence Sen. And if there was no George Cook who survived, there would be no Bennett James, Bella Jane, William Jack, Wyatt James, Cade Houston, Camden Joy, Jay, or a little girl coming in July. That was a significant event, at least for me. I wouldn't be here if George didn't make it. But I'm here physically because he did. I believe this pandemic that we're going through, God wants to not only hopefully deliver people physically, but more importantly, spiritually. And it could be that God is using a very difficult circumstance, such as the coronavirus, COVID-19, to get us all thinking about life and death and purpose, and especially the good news I just shared, the resurrection of Jesus. Next week, I'm gonna talk about heaven to our church family. I think it's a wonderful subject study for us at this time. I invite others to come back and watch. But for you today, is it that he's using circumstances in your life to really humble us and humble you and bring you to a breaking point, bring you to a point where you, you cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, I need you. Uh, I, I need you more than ever. I, I need your forgiveness. I need your cleansing. I need your grace. Have you called on the Lord? And could it be that the Lord, even now, is working in your heart on, on Easter of, of 2020, where you come to the cross and say, I believe you died for me. I believe with all my heart. You, you, the just, died for me, the unjust. Would you acknowledge that? Would you acknowledge that he was buried? And would you believe in your heart that, that God raised Jesus from the dead that third day? If you believe that he died for you and he rose again, and in faith you cry out to him for forgiveness and salvation, you're going to be saved. For whosoever, the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's a man who asked Paul, what must I do to be saved? And he said, believe on the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved. So if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you cry out to him in faith, asking for forgiveness, asking him to be your savior, he'll come into your heart immediately and save you. I think it'd be very appropriate for you in these next few moments to think on these words. This is a model prayer, a sinner's prayer. It doesn't save you. It's a template that you could pray from your heart to God's heart, simply acknowledging you're a sinner, believing that Jesus died for you, he rose again. But most importantly, by faith, asking him to be merciful to you, a sinner, and what you'll find out is he's ready to forgive. He is a merciful God, and he'll save you and change your life. And we'll look back at this time and where the Lord used a pandemic such as the coronavirus as the turning point in your life where you came to Jesus. Would you come to Christ today? Would you call upon him in faith? I'd like to pray for you before we close with one last hymn. Heavenly Father, you know those who are listening. You know those who need Jesus as their Savior. And maybe it took a pandemic like this in unrest and uncertainty to bring them to a point to believe in your Son who came, was born of a virgin, died, was buried, and rose again. Lord, I believe that resurrection story with all of my heart. Lord, work in hearts this morning. If there's someone who's never called on you in faith, May they today call on you and be born again, be born into your family, become a child of yours by faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We invite you to sing along with us as we sing here. Crown him with many crowns. Jesus Christ is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God on high. He is in a position of power. He is not defeated. He is victorious over sin, 
over death, over the grave, and he is our King of Kings. Let's sing that together. Last week, my family had the opportunity to be at home and to sing along, so I know what it's like for you. Uh, we turned up the volume and sang right along. So crown him with many crowns. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. Mark how the happy and the drowns, all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee, and hail him as thy matchless king. Crown him the Lord of love, he hold his hands and sighed, which wounds yet visible above, in beauty glorified, no angel in the sky can fully bear that sight. But downward bent his wandering eye at mystery so bright. Crown him the Lord of life, who triumphed o'er the grave, who rose victorious to the strife for those he came to save. His glories now we sing. Died and rose on high, who died eternal life to bring, and lives that death may die. Crown him the Lord of heaven, one with the Father, one with the Spirit, who is him from his eternal. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of love, the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came, who lived a perfect, spotless, sinless life as the Lamb of God, who died on the cross for our sins that we might have eternal life, and who rose triumphant over the grave so that we also might know eternal life, the resurrection from the dead, and eternity in home, with, in heaven with you. Lord, I pray for those who might be listening this morning who have yet to place their faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone for their salvation. Lord, would you uh, speak to their hearts this morning by your Spirit, draw them to yourself, call them to you as your children. I pray that they might rejoice today as their day of salvation, that they might pray and receive Christ as their Savior. For those of us who know and love you and await your coming, I pray, Lord, you'd give us a spirit of faith and of power of love and of a sound mind that we might deliver the good news to those who are lost and hurting in this world today. Thank you for your constant provision in this uh, crisis, both financial and physical. Thank you, Lord, that your church can shine in the midst of a dark and a perverse world with the love and the grace of Christ. Father, I pray that you might find us to be faithful witnesses until Jesus comes, for we ask it in his gracious and most holy name, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you.